Dudes, we got a lot to go over in this video. I have been seeing a few comments around other videos of mine where viewers uh, have asked what examples I can think of of well-known authors and even lesser known authors who have done a good job of marketing. And I thought, what better way to just talk about those things and nerd out about them together than to just make a full-on video dedicated to that question. So here we are. They're gonna go in the order of big, mid-list to small. First up, we got our homeboy, John Green. And I actually used to to have a book of his around here and then I think I gave it away but in case you don't know who John Green is he is a number one New York Times best-selling author who wrote probably one of the books that everyone knows best which is The Fault in Our Stars or maybe even Paper Towns he's a youtuber a podcaster and a philanthropist and he's seen a lot of success in his life and I personally really enjoyed diving into his approach to marketing his books and his brand. So he initially began working as a publishing assistant at a well-known book review journal known as Booklist here in Chicago. He was working on his first book, Looking for Alaska, and he published that in 2005 through a division of Penguin Random House. And this book was, was very much based on his own high school experience. That's what I read and was eventually awarded the 2006 Michael L. Prince Award. And I forgot to look up why what that is. Oh, okay. An American Library Association Literary Award that annually recognizes the best book written for teens based entirely on its literary merit. Wow. That makes sense though, because if he worked at Booklist, he was probably around a lot of like literary reviewers, including the ALA. So that kind of makes sense. And that's really cool. So the success of his first book really set him up well as an up and coming voice, meaning that he was no doubt getting more attention, especially if you're an award winner. Two years Years later, on January 1st, 2007, he and his brother Hank ceased textual communication and began talking primarily through blogs on a very well-known YouTube channel that is now known as the Vlog Brothers. And I never like stuck around and watched his stuff, but I've been privy to some of the videos and stuff that he posts and you know, whatever the algorithm feeds me, if it looks you know good, I'll click on it. And I've seen a couple of his videos and I, and I know that generally like how it works, he and his brother, you know, respond to one another through video formats. And what's cool about this is because it was pretty unique and it was on a platform that was already seeing a lot of success, especially in the mid 2000s, this spawned a community of people called nerd fighters who quote, fought for intellectualism and to decrease the overall worldwide level of suck. And that was a direct quote from John Green's uh, bio tab on his website. And they've done some really cool stuff with this kind of platform because they've helped raise millions of dollars to fight poverty in developing countries. And even in honor of Hank, John's brother's 30th birthday, uh, they did a campaign where they planted thousands of trees around the world, which is really cool. And I have no doubt that this set him up really well to launch yet another YouTube channel, again with his brother Hank, called Crash Course. And this was done four years later with funding from YouTube's original channel initiative, where they teach humanities and science courses. And actually, I've also watched a lot of Crash Course crash course history for like schooling and like college and like if I have to like write an essay and I like need a TLDR version or something of it like I've watched crash crash course why is that hard to say crash course before and I really like the vibe that he and his brother have going on I've read a couple of John Green's books so based on all of that research that I saw he made a lot of good industry connections he wrote a quality book he leveraged his attention toward other forms of content that ultimately led to his brand and side note I don't know if that was intentional or not or if it was just something that happened to line up that way either way I think it was very well done and fourth this all culminates into a brand image that orbits around three main things Things, stories, humor, and humanities. So in John Green's case, I think that he leveraged the attention that he got, whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether it was lucky or good timing or whatever, I really can't say. But based on this information, it just seemed like he leveraged the attention that he got really well and in, in, in a very timely way. Pool all of that attention from his book to his YouTube channel to Crash Course, and it all kind of feeds into one another. And he's gone on to write a bunch of other books too. The Philanthropist review. I don't even rem I don't remember what the title is, but I know what the cover looks like. So it was really fun diving into his book. Based on all that's been said, that's what I had to say around John Green, his marketing tactics and strategies for his book and brand. Next up, we have the lovely Courtney Mom, who was the author of a really awesome book that uh, I purchased with my own money called Before and After the Book Deal. And it's a really, really amazing guide if you want hyper specific information on very particular aspects or segments of the publishing process. If you are wanting to get your book published, you have a lot of specific 
questions to ask, this is a really good guide to kind of help point you in the right direction or answer it to the best of its ability. She's an author, she's a writing coach, she's a director of a writing workshop and an educator. And on her website, she says that her mission is to help people hold on to the joy of art making in a culture obsessed with torturing artists into brands, which I thought was a really interesting take because she spent over 20 years in the marketing space as a brand strategist and consultant for both large and small agencies, including Target, L'Oreal, Burt's Bees, Apartment One, River and Wolf, PS212. I don't know what those last two one are, I'm sorry. I also looked on her LinkedIn, I did a little bit of sleuthing and she was quote, a shade and product namer for MAC Cosmetics. But anyway, that's her whole background. That's kind of her whole mission. Her first book really is called Notes from Mexico, which won the Cupboard's 2012 Annual Chat Book Contest. And I had to look that up because I was not familiar with it. The Cupboard is a small press that annually publishes four chat books or books that are written between 5,000 and 10,000 words of formally strange or conceptually bizarre prose. And I was curious as to what the perks of winning that was. And I found a blog with help from ChatGPT that kind of broke down what the guidelines were and like what the winner gets if they win this competition, but it only went back to 2018 and not 2012 when she originally won that competition. But just to kind of give you an idea, it said that the winner was going to get $200, 20 copies of their chat book distribution through their website and affiliate stores and have an interview that would be published within that chat book. After winning the chat book competition, her debut novel was called I'm Having So Much Fun Here Without You, which was published through an imprint of Simon & Schuster. Three years later, she published Touch, which was published through a division of Penguin Random House. In 2019, it was Costalagre, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, through Tin House Books, which is a mid-sized press. And then in 2020, we have Before and After the Book Deal, which was published through another mid-sized press called Catapult. And then lastly, her most recent book was published in 2022, I believe it's a memoir, if I recall correctly, called The Year of the Horses, which was also published through Tin House Books. So she's got a really nice mix of working with small, medium, and large presses, which is kind of cool to see because I don't feel like you ever, I don't really feel like you get to see or meet or hear about people that kind of have that sort of wide portfolio. But I was reading up on an interview that was posted on Substack, kind of talking about what she did immediately after publishing the book. And she said that she had a MailChimp newsletter called Get Published, Stay Published, or something along those lines, where she would give honest writing advice. And her agent at the time, or I don't know if it's still the same agent or what, but either way, her agent convinced her to migrate from MailChimp to Substack. She was like, what the heck are you still doing on MailChimp, sister? I have a client who just made $15,000 off of Substack. You need to like jump ship and like get on that boat. So she tried to like migrate it on her own. And she ended up, I think, sending out a accidental test email to like all of her subscribers or something. And she's like, I'm not about to do this. So she hired someone to help with that migration from MailChimp to Substack. And that person recommended that she name the blog the same thing as her book, which I did know I was subscribed to Courtney Mom for a while when I was exploring Substack a little bit more. And yeah, if you look her up or the title of her book, her stuff will pop up, which I think is a pretty smart move. And this is where she continues talking about publishing, writing, mental health advice, time management. So because Courtney Mom's extensive background in branding is incredibly relevant, especially as she's building up her own author brand and image. It's worth noting that a few years later, I forgot to write down when, but I think it was like in the mid 2010s, she launched the Query Doula, where she provides agent query letter and artist statement services. And I don't doubt that as a result of publishing this book and becoming pretty well known for it, she was probably experiencing a demand for it through inquiries, through submissions, through questions, through interviews, etc. And I don't know if this was her thought process or not, but I th- either way, I think it was pretty wise for her to be like, you know what, I should probably just open up myself as a service or, you know, as a mentor to people who could learn a bit more about query letter writing or about the business of books or getting feedback on their writing. She also gradually began to introduce more workshops, more interactive sessions at literary festivals, at conferences, at other events where she was invited to speak or be on panels. And I just looked at her website and it looks like she's kind of trying out something a little bit newer, which is offering these writing retreats that is a blend of craft and business instruction through a mentor-led kind of approach to help improve people's writing 
as well as help them navigate the book business. And the per, the current price point that I saw on her retreat that's coming up in October of this year, 2024, is about $4,200. And she's got a whole webpage for it. You can seriously look at it right here if you want. And I think it's going to be taking place in New Mexico. So in terms of Courtney Mom's approach, the way that I kind of summarize this in my head is how she used or leveraged her book's success to extend the experience through workshops, conferences, panels, speaking, and especially retreats. Versus John Green, who leveraged his attention that he got from his books to different platforms that he was on on YouTube. So the order in which I feel like Courtney Mom sort of developed her marketing strategy for herself and her book goes from working with a lot of these well-known brands to build up her credibility and establish herself as a branding expert, using her knowledge to craft a lot of books that have demand, that have interest and intrigue from a specific audience of people, creating demand through those materials and then monetizing off of it. And as a result, the way that I see her, the way that her image is being perceived to someone like me who actually did benefit from her words and what she had to say in her book is write, build, educate. And then lastly, we have a woman named Emily Ruskovich, and I hope I pronounced her name right. And her story, I feel like, is one that goes from zero to 100. It was pretty hard to find specific information on her success story, but I did my absolute best, and I'm gonna try to fill in the blanks as best I can. She wrote the best-selling debut novel called Idaho in 2017 that was published through a division of Penguin Random House, which is very impressive for a debut novel, that was heavily inspired by her experience growing up in Idaho's panhandle on a Hoodoo Mountain. I keep wanting to say Voodoo Mountain. And from what I could find, she graduated from the Iowa Writers' Workshop in 2011, and at the time, at least the information that I was able to find, taught creative writing in the MFA program at at Boise State University. She was also writing short stories for very well-known publications such as Zoetrope, the Virginia Quarterly Review, One Story, the New York Times, the Paris Review, and Lit Hub. And one of the short stories that she wrote was called Owl, which won her the O. Henry Award in 2015 and was included in its subsequent anthology. So she was already building up a lot of credibility, adding a lot of prestige to her name, building connections through her academic studies and work. So she wrote Idaho, which was published in 2017, which won her the 100 Euro International Dublin Literary Award. And I saw briefly in an article that this initially started out as a 70 page novella, which her editor and creative writing professor both suggested had the potential to be a book. It took her about six years to write it as a book, if I am understanding this correctly, which was eventually published through Penguin Random House and then won her that really prestigious award. And I think I saw somewhere too that she was one of two or one of four Americans to win this award. So already, the prestige is just oozing. Now, her journey is one that I'm fully aware is incredibly difficult to replicate, but this is kind of how I broke it down in my head. This, what, this is what I kind of understood as her sort of sequence of events. She read a lot, she wrote a lot, which kind of helped position her if she was submitting it to these like magazines and outlets and stuff. She taught a lot, which maybe helps her build up those connections and leverage those things to write this book, win all these awards, get all this prestige that ultimately, in my opinion, makes me interpret her brand as being one that is up and coming, that's prestigious, and that's very notable. Now, again, I don't know if that's exactly how it happened, but I don't doubt that a combination of all of those things definitely well positioned her for a lot of those opportunities. Now, that was a lot of information that we went over. We had John Green, who leveraged his attention to direct people to other types of platforms. We had Courtney Mom, who extended the experience beyond the book to be something that people could pay to experience or subscribe to experience. And then we had Emily Ruskovich, who went from zero to 100 through a combination of a few things, including her connections, quality of her writing, and getting small stories and publications featured in very well-known outlets. So what is all of this to say? What's a way to sort of summarize all of this information and how can we translate those into immediate actionables for you? So the first takeaway that I have is that good marketing is going to be a healthy combination of creative thinking and relationship building. I have experienced this firsthand and I've seen it quite a lot. 
where people often think that because they wrote a book, everything's going to come together, that their people are just going to be fawning over them. They're going to find their book amongst the millions on Amazon and catapult them to stardom like Colleen Hoover, but that is definitely more of the exception than the norm. So yes, you want to have outward efforts. If you want to pay for campaigns or ads, you can. If you want to focus on organic marketing and social media, you can. I believe that there are more than two ways to make two numbers add up to 10. I would say that it's a combination of creative thinking and that way, directing it towards your marketing within your capabilities and abilities and budget, and also connecting and networking and just talking and having conversations with people who want to help you and are willing to introduce you to other people to help you along your journey. The second thing that I would say is that you are going to start out small unless you have immediate industry connections that can help you out right away, which is okay because I think slow burns are fine. I think there's just a lot of pressure for people to just suddenly take off. I feel like a lot of these viral moments are very sensationalized. They're very romanticized to the point where sometimes it can seem like that's just something that should happen. So use each small small win as a stepping stone and leverage what you can to upgrade you to the next great opportunity. It's like you're trading a paperclip for a pin, for a pencil, for a pen, for a stapler, for whatever. That's almost how I think about it. And then number three, please consider how a book will fit into your brand strategy, whether you already have one or not, whether you whether or not you already have a brand, whether or not you already have a brand strategy. Just think about if I write this book hypothetically and I get everything that I want in a perfect world that all works out, what would you do with that? When you write a book, you are going to get an influx of attention. Whether it's a small pool of people, whether it's a big pool of people, it's mostly it's most likely going to be bigger than what you're currently working with. So think about when you have this attention, when you have 30 seconds of attention or one year's worth of attention, because that's how long a book is new in the eyes of the industry, what are you gonna do about that? Where, what do you want people to do? What do you wanna say? Where do you want people to look? Where, where do you want people to go? Just give them direction and give yourself direction. So with that all being said, I have a few actionables to kind of help you direct all this new knowledge into actual steps you can take today, next week, next month, whenever you want. The first one is going to be read the books that you want to write, read the publications that you want to pitch to, whatever you decide to do, wherever you want to put your attention, where whatever you want to contribute to, read the stuff. <laughs> and sort of secondary to that is feel free to submit your ideas, spinoffs of your book, whatever, inspirational pieces, pieces to get people thinking, to challenge people, whatever. Feel free to submit them to magazines, to blogs, to journals, to articles, to newspapers, to build your portfolio and credibility simultaneously. Number three, get involved with the right community for you, whether this be academics, whether this be clubs, whether this be through your job, whether this be through events, whatever the case may be. Like I said, there's more than two ways to make two numbers add up to 10, but get involved in some kind of community because people need support. You need to meet people and it's a great way to just get involved with the community and then you have people who support you when you do have a win and wanna celebrate it with you. And you can do the same for other people as well. You're building that what are you building? You're building that reciprocity. And number four, which I think is probably the most important and one of the best places to start, which is that you want to get clear on what you want, why you want it, and how you're going to ask for it when you're given the right opportunity to ask for it. Especially if you're talking with industry experts, if you're going to conferences, if you're signing up to pitch to agents or whatever, whatever your goals are, whatever your dreams are, whatever kind of road you want to go down, I think that would be a really, really great ex exercise for you. Consider what you want, why you want it, how you plan on asking for it if you're given the right person or the right opportunity. I hope this was helpful. Um, I'm happy to do a few more of these if you would like. It just took a lot of research, which was fun to do. I, I mean, this was this was fun to do. So if you got something out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing by doing that. You're telling YouTube that, yeah, this video is pretty cool. It's worth watching. I got something out of it. And then it helps other people find the video that way as well. That's all I got. See you in the next video. Take care until then. Bye.